Hello, my name is Miriam Winters. I am the Irish Ambassador of Amgen Teach. You are very welcome to this webinar organised by the PDST and Amgen Teach. In this webinar, we are going to showcase the work by a group of Irish science teachers under the guidance of Dr. Miriam Nugent, Dr. Enda Carr, and Dr. Declan Cathcart. Here are the contact details. Biotechnology through inquiry. Amgen Teach supports science teachers across Europe by providing training workshops and distance learning events. These training opportunities provide educators with the skill and competence to transform the science classroom experience for students. Amgen Teach is active in 10 EU countries. In Ireland, Amgen Teach is partnered with the Professional Development Service for Teachers. Amgen runs two courses, Amgen Biotech Experience and Amgen Teach. This is an Amgen Teach project. Amgen Teach offers high quality courses that improves the teacher's understanding of inquiry-based science education. The Professional Development Service for Teachers is Ireland's largest single support service. It offers professional learning opportunities to teachers and school leaders. The aim of the PDST is to provide high quality professional development and support that empowers teachers and schools to provide the best possible education for all students. Inquiry-based science education is a form of science education that gives students the opportunity to explore hands-on, to experiment, to ask questions and to develop responses based on reasoning. Here we have this energy stick, right? And we're going to get Jerry to hold one end of it and Mary to hold the other end and see what do we predict will happen or what would our students expect to happen? The workshops are a three-day event for science educators. The teachers come out and day one we develop inquiry-based learning and how it would look in schools. Day two, the teachers go back and they collaborate with their colleagues in school. And day three, the teachers come out again and we share the learning and further develop how we might implement the inquiry-based learning in school. The circuit isn't complete. The circuit isn't complete. How can we complete the circuit? All right, get Mary and Jerry to touch hands, and there we go. So thank you for that. Inquiry-based science education is a teaching and learning strategy that resonates with cognitive theories of learning and has its roots in constructivism. It is an attempt to align student activity and thinking processes with those of real scientists. Okay, the question is, what would happen if I superimpose a yellow filter on that? What would I get when the three of them overlap? The workshops are very important because teachers get to come out and collaborate with their colleagues. They get to see how inquiry-based learning will look like in the classroom, but also it helps the students to move away from rote learning and to develop and construct their own understanding of science concepts. Let's try it and see what happens. Well, in general, what I try to do is to show something that people think they know and ask them to tell me what they think is going to happen. And I've picked things that I'm pretty sure the, the result is not what they expect. So that now they're forced to rethink. I suppose back when I was in school, um, you know, the teacher just put information up on the board and you literally took it down and learned it off by heart. So you, were, you weren't questioning anything. Nothing was kind of coming from yourself. It was just learn this, do that. Um, whereas in inquiry-based learning, I suppose really te the teacher is just facilitating and um, I suppose guiding the whole process of learning. So the topic that we said we were going to um, have a look at today was current electricity. 
So they might pose a question or they might usually show some students something so the students observe something. And then really from that, the students will ask their own questions or predict. Um, so they're really kind of making the learning um, kind of part of themselves. Today we have uh, a new little device. So we just have a nice little energy stick and hopefully this will kind of make this topic a little bit more, um, you can understand it a little bit more. Yeah, there's like lots of experiments to help us like understand some topics which you have to work in groups for, like, you know. And it really does help because sometimes in exams I think back to those experiments and they like help me to learn off the topic or they're related to the topic so that helps me in like exam situations or in class. <gasps> now, what's going on there? We're all conducting and why did I have to hold your hands? To complete the circuit. Yeah, the human chain circuit was excellent. It was a real hands-on way of uh, portraying a really difficult topic in physics. Um, a lot of students have problems with the electricity, but getting the students active in the classroom a simple resource, getting them to hold hands, to signify that a closed circuit, that the current will flow and that adding in a conductor or adding in an insulator, that how will it affect the current? It was very hands-on and definitely something that would stick in their head. Okay, one, two, three, hold hands. <laughs> <laughs> Students love when you actually question them and ask them, you know, to reflect on a class and how did that work and how, you know, why did it work or did you enjoy it or did you not? Um, and they're actually very articulate when, when you do, um, you know, ask them to, um, to discuss how they got on in the class. It can show you what is like a conductor and what's an insulator. Fantastic. So the prediction is this energy stuff, we can use it. If the learning is enjoyable, then the learner will probably learn more and put more time into it. But it must also be achievable. So we try and keep the bar at a particular level that's suitable to the learner. I think it's a lot better because that way everyone's getting involved. Everyone has like their own kind of like saying things. Everyone has their own voice. So instead of like just listening to the teacher and taking down slides and like not on, like really getting it, you can work it out in the class, have your own voice and like you can say to the teacher like this is what my point is and like they'll take it into like account. There's definitely more student engagement and um, the students are learning like by a hands-on approach. Um, it's they're investigating, they're discussing certain things, um, they learn by doing rather than you just feeding them the information. Um, it's more exciting, it's more creative for them and overall they have a better understanding at the end of it. Inquiry-based science education also enhances critical thinking skills, turns students into active learners, engages students to analyze and compare results, allows learning by experience, offers a new innovative teaching methodology and practice and promotes teamwork and collaboration skills. The aim of this project was to support teachers as reflective practitioners. This provided a range of professional development opportunities and supports that enable teacher learning, collaboration and evidence-based practice with a particular emphasis on inquiry-based learning, development of resources, assessment of inquiry, and learner experiences and outcomes. This project supported and enhanced teachers' practice in inquiry-based science education and assessment of inquiry skills. Teachers enhanced their understanding of how inquiry approaches could be encouraged and facilitated in the classroom. The collaborative approach of working in small groups, both face-to-face -face during the workshop and within online collaboration spaces, allowed teachers to share experiences, expertise and knowledge. Teachers were randomly assigned to the following experimental groups. They were asked to produce 
inquiry and assessment units based on the practical activities and inquiry approaches. The unit investigating lactic acid bacteria was carried out by Shauna Walsh and Hilary Rimby. Hilary presented this unit of work at the Irish Science Teachers Association. This unit was carried out with transition year students who are aged between 15 and 17 years. The transition year is designed to act as a bridge between the junior certificate and leaving certificate programmes and it is unique to Ireland. It is usually optional and each school designs its own transition year programme within set guidelines to suit the needs and interests of its student. This unit of work was designed to be delivered over three class periods of 45 minutes per week. The module was therefore designed for four weeks, that is 12 class periods. Lactobacillus in probiotics. Actimil claims to contain 10 billion exclusive Lactobacillus casei cultures in every bottle. In this unit, we are going to put that theory to the test. But first, we need to learn some new lab skills. The first lab skill students will become familiar with are those of aseptic techniques. Aseptic techniques underpin all work in microbiology. They are measures taken to, as far as is possible, to exclude unwanted microorganisms from the materials students will be working with. To prepare students for this lesson, they are asked to watch and answer questions on a video and ed puzzle. The teacher demonstrates these techniques in the next practical class and students then practice the techniques in pairs. The second lab skill students will practice is that of making and pouring agar plates. Making agar plates is a relative straightforward procedure, but there are a few finer points that can ruin the experiment, make a mess, or just cause students inconvenience if they get them wrong. Students are asked to watch a video and read a handout on tips for making the perfect agar plate. M or S agar is used as lactic acid bacteria thrive on it, whereas other organisms do not. This will ensure that the results are as accurate as possible. The materials needed to make MRSA agar plates are spatula, wayboat, electronic balance, conical flask, graduated cylinder, magnetic stir and plate, hot plate or autoclave, gloves and sterile petri dishes. MRSA agar is acquired, as is deionized water. The procedure for making MRSA agar plates. Make up the medium according to the manufacturer's instructions or to the recipe provided. Then add the desired amount of agar. This is normally about 1% weight for volume and stir. Make sure you use a stirrer to evenly distribute the agar. If you autoclave without stirring, with the agar still floating in the top of the liquid, you will get an agarose cake in the medium. If an autoclave is not available, heat the agar mixture gently on hot plate until it becomes transparent. Autoclaving the mixture usually takes 15 to 20 minutes at 10 to 15 pounds PSI. Before placing the bottles in the autoclave or pressure cooker, make sure that the screw tops are loose. If using cotton wool stoppers, cover the cotton wool with a piece of aluminium foil. After autoclaving, you can of course store the medium, the agar mix, in a toughened glass bottle and then melt it in a microwave or water bath when needed. Cool the mixture 
to 55 degrees in a water bath before pouring the plates. Label your petri dish. Slim the mouth of the flask. Open the petri plate and start pouring agar carefully slowly so you will avoid getting any bubbles in. The third lab skill students will practice is serial dilution. Each individual colony of bacteria on agar plates grows from one individual microbial cell. This cell reproduces by binary fission to form a colony of millions of cells. This is a key assumption in microbiology research. It means that we can estimate how many bacterial cells there are in a sample. The colonies that we will count on our agar plates are called colony forming units or CFUs. Because the actimal sample will form too many CFUs to count, we will need to perform a serial dilution. A serial dilution is a procedure we use to dilute our sample by a known factor each time. Micro pipettes are used for this technique. The image shown demonstrates how the dilutions will affect the colony forming units on the agar plates. In this video, you will learn how to quantify the concentration of bacteria in a culture using the serial dilution and plate count method. Label seven sterile microcentrifuge tubes with the dilution factor 10 to the first, 10 to the second, 10 to the third, 10 to the fourth, 10 to the fifth, 10 to the sixth, and 10 to the seventh. In lab four, students learn how to micro pipette. A micro pipette is used to transfer very small and exact volumes of liquids in either milliliters or microliters. Both are measurements of volume, which are most often used in microbiology, molecular biology and genetic engineering. This laboratory will give students the chance to learn how to use micro pipettes and to see the relative size of different volumes of solution measured by this very precise tool and how precise the volumes that you can measure with it are. 200 microliters and the three digit number that you see correlates to the actual number of microliters that you'll be drying and dispensing. For the P1000 the effective range is 200 to 1000 microliters and you'll multiply the three-digit number you see by 10 in order to get the number of microliters that you'll be working with. Each micropipette has a plunger at the top that has two stops on it. The first stop is used to prime the micropipette to draw liquid, and the second stop is used to expel everything in the micropipette tip. Now I'll take you through the steps of actually using the micropipette. First you need to get a new tip every time you use a new substance or the tip you're using touches anything. You need to then check your volume setting. Right now we're using the P200 at a 100 setting so that will be 100 microliters. You depress the plunger to the first stop and then put the tip in the substance and release the plunger slowly to draw the liquid. You'll then depress the plunger to the second stop in order to expel everything. When you're finished, press the button next to the plunger to eject. To eject.
using a 100 to 1000 microliter micropipette, set the volume to 900 microliters. Using aseptic technique, pipette 900 microliters of LB broth into each microcentrifuge tube. Next, using a 20 to 200 microliter micropipette, set the volume to 100 microliters. Using aseptic technique, pipette 100 microliters of bacteria culture into the microcentrifuge tube labeled 10 to the first. Mix by vortexing or pipetting up and down at least five times. Remove 100 microliters of diluted cell culture from the tube labeled 10 to the first and add it to the tube labeled 10 to the second. Mix by vortexing or pipetting up and down at least five times. Continue to serially dilute the bacterial culture into each consecutive tube until the tube labeled 10 to the 7th is used. Mix the diluted cell culture in the tube labeled 10 to the first and using aseptic technique, pipette 100 microliters onto the LB auger plate labeled 10 to the first. Sterilize an inoculation loop or bacterial spreader by flaming and then allow it to cool. Very gently spread the bacterial culture over the entire surface in all directions, including the edge of the plate. Do not use the streak plate technique because you are not isolating for single colonies. Plate 100 microliters of each dilution on the matching plate as in this example. When finished, stack the plates upside down and place in an incubator at 37 degrees Celsius for 16 to 24 hours. After 16 to 24 hours, your plates will be ready for analysis of results. In Lab 6, students will use numeracy skills to estimate the number of bacteria on each plate. In the example below, the first three plates have too many CFUs to count. The fifth plate has too few, but the fourth plate has the right number. Once there are between 20 and 100 CFUs, we can count them and work backwards with our calculations from that dilution to find out how many are on the original sample. During this unit of work, 
a variety of assessment techniques were used. Formative assessments carried out throughout the unit of activity involved class discussions, checklists, progress journals, peer and self-evaluation, and teacher and student observation. Summative assessments, which were carried out at the end of the unit, incorporated written test, poster projects, research projects, and oral presentations. Evidence of student work is recorded on the following slides. The unit Gel Electrophoresis and DNA Profiling was carried out by the following teachers. Gronier Groyuriu, Fiona McDonough, Idel Morrow, Julie Tobin and Miriam Winters. Gronier, Idel and Miriam presented this unit at the Irish Teachers Association Conference in Dublin City University. Learning outcomes. Number one, to develop investigative skills. Number two, to be able to understand biological concepts. Number three, to be able to manipulate equipment for DNA profiling. Number four, to explain how the DNA profile may be used and read. This unit was carried out with transition year students. It took four weeks to complete, with one single period and one double period weekly. Learning intentions. Students will be able to explain how the micropipette functions, correctly use a micropipette accurately to measure microliters, Correctly use a micropipette to transfer small quantities of liquid. Explain how the gel electrophoresis kit works. Load a sample onto Agro's gel. Explain how the samples are separated and to be able to interpret the results. The experiment was carried out in the following manner. Students were placed into teams. Teams were introduced to the challenge of solving a crime using extracted DNA. Seven DNA samples were provided. One DNA sample was found at the crime scene and the students were asked to determine which of the other six DNA samples matches the DNA at the crime scene. DNA profiling techniques and gel electrophoresis equipment were used to solve the crime. Students made a plan to solve this investigation. Each team member was assigned a role. Safety issues were discussed. All equipment was then set up. Students practiced new techniques such as micropipetting, filling the wells of the agros gel and using the gel electrophoresis equipment prior to starting the investigation. A buffer of volume 1,000 cm cubed was made up. Students poured 50 cm cubed of this buffer into a clean 250 cm cubed conical flask. The remaining 750 cm cubed was kept for the running buffer. 0.5 grams of agrose powder is required to make a 1% gel. TBE buffer was carefully added to the dry agrose powder and mixed well. The mixture was placed in a 250 centimeters cubed conical flask and microwaved on full power for 30 seconds. 
The mixture was then swirled carefully and heated again for 10 seconds in the microwave. Next, the solution was held up to the light to check that all the agarose has dissolved. If not, it was placed into the microwave again for another 10 seconds. The solution was allowed to cool to 60 degrees Celsius. Some teams used a water bath to maintain a more accurate temperature regulation. Students added safe green or a similar stain for DNA to the gel. Before pouring the gel, students made sure the gel tray was on a horizontal surface so that the gel would be of uniform thickness. The combs were then inserted into the gel tray before pouring. This formed the cavities called wells, into which all the students practiced pipetting the DNA samples. One member of the team slowly poured the gel into the gel tray. Using disposable pipette tips, students practiced moving any bubbles to the edge of the gel. This is especially important around the wells. The gel was left to solidify. While it was setting, the gel was not moved. Students discovered that the easiest way to remove the cones was to hold the combs with their fingers and thumbs at the edge while pushing down on the sides of the gel tray when lifting up the cone slowly. All students were given the opportunity to become proficient at using a micropipette. A new chip was always used for each DNA sample to avoid cross-contamination. Great care was taken not to puncture the well at the bottom of the tray with the tip of the micropipette when loading the wells. Buffer was poured carefully into the gel electrophoresis tank. Students placed the photo hood on top of the gel tank. Then the device was switched on. It was noticed that small segments moved faster than the larger segments. Each team member checked every five minutes to see how far the bands were moving. The gel was allowed to run for 20 minutes or until the DNA separation was sufficiently complete. Students recorded how the DNA fragments move in electrophoresis. When the run was complete, one member of the team turned off the power. The results were recorded by each team. A discussion of how to solve the crime was had by looking at the lengths and the position of the DNA protein fragments. Comparisons were made with the crime scene's DNA. Each team discussed the results and made a decision on which suspect was guilty of the crime. A PowerPoint presentation was made by each team explaining the whole procedure of solving this investigation. All teams presented their presentations in front of their peers and gave a reflection on how the investigation was conducted. A whole class discussion was conducted on the findings from all the teams. In the final plenary session, the teams discussed what went well, what they thought was difficult, and how they overcame any challenges. Members of each team explained how they had learned new lab skills and developed the skills of problem solving in a real life context. Students completed an individual and group reflection sheet. The facilitator completed an assessment rubric for each team.
Here are a few examples of how students felt about carrying out the experiment and the skills they learned. This activity provided an opportunity for students to improve not only their scientific knowledge and laboratory skills, but also skills in communication, peer learning, problem solving, critical thinking, collaboration, and digital media skills. All these skills are reflected in the inquiry-based scientific education teaching methodology. The teacher acted as a facilitator to direct and advise students, orchestrating and scaffolding team activities which ensured a student-centered learning experience. Students reported that they enjoyed developing confidence in the use of micropipettes and in analyzing DNA fragments to solve the crime. The topic of photosynthesis is rarely greeted with enthusiasm by students. It is a complex process that requires a mature understanding of many abstract ideas and is not easy to illustrate in a pra practical way. In Ireland, we traditionally used Elodea to conduct these experiments. However, it is now categorised as an invasive species and can no longer be used. A new practical procedure is proposed, which involves the immobilization of algae and measurement of the color changes that take place as the algae use up carbon dioxide from the hydrogen carbonate indicator. At the end of this practical investigation, students will understand the basic process of photosynthesis, the role of environmental factors on the rate of photosynthesis, Students will be able to describe the function of photosynthesis, identify the reactants and the products of photosynthesis, and measure the effect of light intensity and other factors on the rate of photosynthesis. At the end of this unit of learning, student inquiry skills will have been promoted. Students will pose questions and form hypotheses, Students will design and conduct scientific investigations. Students will make measurements and record data. Students will use mathematical operations to analyze and interpret data. Students will generate tables and graphs to present their data. Students will use experimental data to make conclusions about their initial question and to support or refute the stated hypothesis. Students will follow lab safety rules and regulations. The materials required for this investigation are outlined below. A healthy culture of Senidesmus algae is needed to carry out the practical. The starter culture was purchased and the culture initially grown on for four weeks in order to supply enough material for several classes of pupils. 
The culture was maintained using an enrichment medium in a two litre clear plastic bottle. In order to allow circulation and aeration with carbon dioxide, a lift pump was used. A small diameter plastic pipe, just shorter than the total height of the bottle, was inserted into the neck of the bottle and the airflow was set. The bottle was illuminated under a fluorescent light and the temperature was kept at between 18 and 20 degrees Celsius. After about four weeks, a dark green pea soup colour was obtained. Samples of Sindesma's algae are immobilised in a 2% sodium alginate solution and placed dropwise into a solution of 2% calcium chloride to harden. While this is taking place, bicarbonate indicator is acidified by exhaling through it with a straw for approximately one minute. A colour change from deep red to yellow orange indicates that this is complete. Once hardened, four equal samples of the beads are divided among four algal slopes. The acidified indicator is added to the slopes, just enough to cover the beads. The beads are then set at varying distances from a light source and are left for approximately one hour. After one hour, the colour changes are compared to an indicator colour chart. The greater the increase in pH, the greater the rate of photosynthesis. Finally, a graph of the results is generated. Light intensity is the independent variable and is proportional to 1 over d squared, where d is the distance to the lamp in metres. The pH is the dependent variable. To extend this investigation, students were asked to propose scientific questions that they would investigate. The following is a list of proposed scientific questions by different groups of students. Once the student had proposed their scientific questions, they were asked to fill out an experimental design worksheet. The teacher read the experimental protocol and discussed any necessary changes with the students at the start of the next lesson. Hi, my name is Michael Fiorentina, I teach in Holy Family Community School, Rathcool, County Dublin. As part of the PDST Amgen Teaching Initiative, I was part of a group tasked with developing a short inquiry module based around the topic of respiration. Respiration is typically a tough topic to teach as students find the biochemistry quite conceptual and hard to visualize. Our group aimed to tackle this problem using a simple respirometer. The simple respirometer is appropriately named as it is very quick to set up and requires minimal teacher preparation. The setup simply requires one plastic dropper, a graduated cylinder, dried yeast, water and a little sugar. As the yeast respires it quite quickly starts to produce visible bubbles of CO2 which can be measured, recorded and compared to investigate optimal conditions for yeast. It allows you to investigate pH, temperature, sugar concentration and strain of yeast. This simple setup makes it really easy to embed loads in numeracy as the students have to deal with massive amounts of data as they count the bubbles and how the bubbles change depending on how they change each of these variables. In the short scheme of learning, the students had an opportunity to research and plan their entire experiment from start to finish. On day two, they carried out the investigation of the first factor. Maybe went back and changed their plan or their hypothesis depending on the results they had. On day three, they carried out an investigation on their second factor. Day four, they sat down in groups, they put their heads together and they designed a presentation that they would show to their peers on day five and they would peer assess. This short five lesson investigation allowed them to actually work within the confines of the scientific method. They got to develop their hypothesis, design their method from start to finish, go back and adapt it. They got to see the safety concerns that would come up and actually plan ahead for them. And they had to actually design how they were going to record the data that they had. So they had to predict. The main reason for the success of this little investigation was that the students sat down in their groups of four or five and they actually highlighted what criteria needs to be in an experimental write-up. 
what should my hypothesis have? What should be my introduction? Have I correctly identified my variables? What equipment will I use? Have I identified the safety? Have I planned to mitigate any risk? Has, is my method short, concise? Is it accurate? Is my diagram there to allow somebody to pick it up and repeat my experiment even though they haven't seen it before? So before the students even started their experiment, they had a means of assessing whether things were going well or whether things needed to change. During the investigation, there were three assessments embedded. One was knowledge-based, and the other two were very much numeracy-based. These provided opportunity to figure out what the learners had actually generated. What did they know about yeast and its preferred environment? Could they work with data? Could they take what they'd seen happen in real reality and deal with it in a data set? Could they identify anomalies? Could they choose the correct graph? Could they make a line of best fit? On completion of the whole investigation, students were invited in their groups to feed back on their experience. And from the data below, you can see that each group had a representative that wrote in what their group was feeling and 80% of the groups thought that this method of carrying out an experiment or an investigation really helped their understanding rather than just being handed a method to follow. Students were actually given the opportunity to feedback on how they found working in a group and as you can see from the data below again 80% of the groups actually found it really doable and actually there actually seemed to be quite enhanced level of enjoyment compared to most leaving cell biology practicals that I've experienced. The simple rest barometer undoubtedly has strengths. Every group got to complete at least one investigation of the effect of a factor on the respiration of yeast. They got to develop some fabulous numeracy skills beyond the scope of the normal leaving cell biology practicals. They all got to develop their presentation skills and their communication skills by exhibiting what they learned to the class. The student enjoyment was massive as everybody was getting really competitive and there was just a really fun atmosphere in the classroom. Looking at the entire investigation, it's five lessons, but some of the skills that the learners developed in it were invaluable to them. This could be fit into either fungi, respiration, or even just as an introduction to the scientific method, as to provide some great opportunity to go from hypothesis conclusion in a completely student-focused way.